and welcome to the next speech. Uh, a famous guy called John Walker. Uh, he will um, uh, talk to us about uh, how to build hardware as a software developer. So, good luck. Um, I'm here uh, uh, at, um, on behalf of VMware. Um, they, they've been kind enough to, to bring me out here to talk to you guys today, um, which is kind, which is going to be kind of interesting because uh, uh, VMware is a virtualization company, and we don't actually uh, uh, really do anything with hardware. And yet here I am. I'm a software guy at an open source conference, and what do I want to talk to you about? Hardware. Specifically, this kind of hardware. Uh, um, if you look at it, this is a this is a really tiny embedded little board. Um, how many people are actually familiar with the ESP8266 or any of the ESP family? Okay, good enough. Uh, um, for those of you who are, who aren't aware of what this is, this is actually a microcontroller that uh, uh, came out a few years ago that wasn't actually intended to be a microcontroller. This was actually intended as a wireless bridge for your actual microcontroller. Uh, um, and uh, uh, a lot of hackers, a lot of really interesting embedded folks all realized that this, uh, um, this particularly cheap uh, 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 part, um, and by cheap I mean literally putting this on a board is about a dollar US to, to, to put it on a board. Um, ha and has Wi-Fi the whole nine yards, but it also has enough of a microcontroller built onto the side of the Wi-Fi uh, uh, system that you can actually run real programs on it. And so this thing has, it has shot off. The, the, the poor company didn't know what they were uh, uh, getting into when they, they released this, and it, it's kind of taken the, the microcontroller world by storm. But it, it, it's a really interesting piece of hardware to talk about from, uh, uh, from the software perspective because it's so, uh, uh, so uh, approachable. But I'll kind of get back to that. So we're all software people for the most part. Actually, how many hardware people are actually in this room? Okay, so there's like three of you who can actually correct me. <laughs> oh, darn it, four! Um, <laughs> oh, I'm in trouble. They can cut me off even. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, the embedded world, or how many embedded developers are in here? How many people actually embedded, or, or develop on embedded systems? I know somebody's from Olimex is here, so they kind of count for that. <laughs> but um, but the, 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 in the embedded world, developing software is really, really hard. And you basically have to start over on every single board you ever want to use. And you, re you basically rebuild the entire universe. So, in, in the interest of starting over and building from nothing, we have a blank slide. And, and, and the, the first thing you do is you go out there, you find your build tool chain, you start trying to figure out all the pieces you need to actually make the hardware that you, you're, you're trying to make run. Uh, uh, um, actually run, and you go, you download it, you get it installed, and you might actually possibly get to the point where you have some Stone Age tools to actually work on your board. Which is great. You can start doing things, you can start compiling things, and you go and you write, uh, you attempt to write Hello World and compile it, and it fails. Because anytime you, you actually co uh, come up with a new piece of hardware, or anytime you install a new build tool chain, it never, ever works right the first time. And if it does, you've probably done something else wrong, and you don't know it yet. So, you take a look at all of this, you look back, you go, great, I can fix this. It's a sim link that's missing here, or a library that's missing there, or something. There, there, there is something that whatever the tool chain you've downloaded didn't take into account that you're on Fedora instead of Ubuntu, or you're on Debian versus Arch or something, and you have to fix it. So you go, you bang around, and you finally get to the point where you can compile Hello World, which is great. You've compiled Hello World, uh, um, which means you're done, right? You're a software person. You've compiled Hello World. Great. It must work. Ship it. Um, the reality is, is that no. I, I, um, from the hardware perspective, you're never done. So by the time you, you, you've actually gotten uh, um, everything put together, and you're trying to get it to all work, and you finally get Hello World, it still looks like this, because this is the way all embedded uh, development works. And even, even if you get to the point uh, um, where, where maybe everything works, you're always still missing something. So, we, 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 you sit there, you try, you try really, really hard, uh, um, and, and you know that tomorrow, 
you have to explain to your boss why you can't get this piece of hardware working and it's all a disaster, it's all terrible, it's fallen off the, the test rig, you have no idea what's going on, and then you believe it works. The, the build tool chain works, your, your, your magic emulator all works, and you're like, great, I can actually test this on hardware. Except that hardware is always hard. Because by, because by the time you get to the point where you can actually put this on the board, you have to find a parallel adapter to go to a serial adapter, to go to a PS2 adapter, because why you need to program your, your, your embedded board with a PS2 adapter, I don't know, but that's always the case, it seems to be. And then, finally, somewhere in the whole mix, you get to a USB adapter that you can actually plug into the board that may or may not work, except that it's probably that the, the USB adapter's been pinned out backwards because the hardware guys are terrible at always pinning everything out backwards. Case in point. <laughs> um, and you get it to work, you get it to upload, and you finally go to test this on real hardware. And you plug the hardware in after you've uploaded the, 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 the code to the device, and it explodes. And by explodes, I mean it catches on fire. Because invariably, uh, um, how, how many people in here have actually developed on real hardware? Like, you, you've developed like way down at the, the bottom layers. How many of you have actually let the magic smoke out of the box? All of you should have had your hands up because the rest of you are lying. <laughs> so as an embedded developer, one of the things you realize very, very quickly is that you will destroy the, the, the board you're working on. Even if, you're, even if you're not in the embedded space, if you're doing uh, hardware at, at any level, you will destroy hardware. Because invariably the hardware is uh, 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 documented wrong. The hardware developers did something wrong. The manufacturer did something wrong. Anybody in the entire chain could have done something wrong, and by the time you as the software developer get to it, it will be broken, or you will have the wrong piece of information. And invariably, you will take the 12-volt line and plug it into the 3.3-volt-only device, and then you will uh, 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 get something that looks about like that. And a uh, case in point, uh, um, a company I worked for many, many years ago built PCBs about this big single PCB about this big. Had 12 full-sized computers uh, uh, on it with two full networking stacks. Uh, largest board that our, our board manufacturer uh, uh, was willing to actually make. Now, the reason they were uh, uh, willing to make, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the reasons they didn't like building boards that big is when you, the, the scale of the board actually matters on, on how everything gets laminated together. And this was a 48-layer board. And for those of you who, who know what, uh, or how hap what, what happens on hardware, a 40, you know, most boards are six, maybe, maybe as high as 12. 48 is well past ridiculous. And to give you an idea, a single board, not, not populated, a single board was $40,000. So, um, but part of the problem is, is that when you get to, to building boards that are really big or really complicated, weird things happen. And, and one of the boards that we had happened to have a small air pocket inside, uh, 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 on the power plane, or on one of the power planes, uh, uh, hidden inside the board. Well, you know what happens when you start putting power through power planes? They get hot. They dissipate heat. You know what happens when you have heat and oxygen? At some point, you get fire and a four-foot flame that shot out the side of the board. And this board is sitting on my wall at home with a toe tag that says, dead four-foot flame outside. So, again, when you're working with hardware, everything is broken and everything is terrible. And everything will eventually catch on fire. But, this is how traditional embedded uh, uh, normally goes. This is not the way all embedded has to go. And this is where some, uh, um, a lot of new things that have been coming into the microcontroller world particular, excuse me, particularly, um, that are changing things for the better, particularly for software people. So, we're gonna rewind time a little bit, and we're gonna go back to, the, uh, 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 to how embedded development, microcontroller development, should be done in the modern age. And we're gonna start talking about things like MicroPython, CircuitPython, 
uh, um, the embedded Node.js stuff, the, uh, um, the, 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 the embedded Lua compiler, all of these new languages, all of these new environments that are starting to come out for things like the ESP8266, the STM32 uh, 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 microcontrollers, all of the, these, these microcontrollers that are now so much more powerful than uh, uh, the 386 that I even started programming on when I was, you know, very small. Um, the, the, the systems literally are faster. So if, if you're not familiar with the 8266, this $1 microcontroller, this has a 200 megahertz CPU. How many people in this room started programming on a CPU that was slower than 200 megahertz? Wow, there's a lot of really young people in this room. I'm feeling old suddenly. <laughs> but for those of you who are, who are not used to this, this is astonishingly fast. This is insanity itself from when we started programming. And from a microcontroller perspective, this is, this is crazy. You know, an 8-bit AT Tiny runs at maybe 10 to 12 megahertz, depending on how you get it compiled and you do certain things. A one, yeah, it could be as, yeah, it could be one. Um, you're right, now that I think about it, the, the yeah, Commodore 64 is ridiculously slow. And this is where we started, guys. I mean, Linux. How many people in this room use Linux? Okay, better question. Who doesn't use Linux in this room? Oh, good. There are no hands. None of you are lying. Because if you went to a web page at all today, if you went to Facebook, if you went to Twitter, you used Linux today. The world fundamentally runs on Linux, whether you believe it or not. No, but you don't know it, and that's okay. If you have a Chromebook, you run Linux. If you have an Android phone, you run Linux. This is the year of the Linux everything. I've, we've given up on the desktop. The desktop can be had by everybody else, but this is the year of the Linux everything. But, so, I digress slightly. We're back to, to, to microcontrollers. We're back to how the embedded world should be, should be run, and we now have these, these microcontrollers and these systems that are so powerful in comparison to what we're used to that we don't actually have to fight with tool chains and getting things compiled. We, well, we'll always have to fight with the FTDI pinout is wrong or the USB port is wired backwards or something silly because, again, hardware is always broken. But we can actually mask a lot of things if we go and we use something like MicroPython. And I'm going to um, specifically talk about MicroPython for the rest of this talk. Um, but you could literally substitute MicroPython for the embedded Lua or any of these other uh, um, new, new languages uh, that are out there. You could almost even do this for Arduino, although Arduino is not nearly as nice as the other ones I'm, I want to talk about right now. But you go. You, you go out to the internet. You find the, the, the MicroPython version for your board. You, you um, mash about, you bang your head on the, the desk until you figure out the exact magic command line to upload it to your ESP8266, which usually involves the fact that there's a, a magic switch called minus M and about six different options that could be under that minus M that you're not sure which flash chip you're using and one of those options will work and the rest don't. <laughs> Sorry, good luck. Uh, 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 on figuring that out, it usually just is trial and error, unfortunately. Sometimes they can be auto-detected. Most of the time they don't. But you finally get it uploaded, you reboot the board, and instead of a giant fire, you're given something shockingly familiar. And this is where embedded development should be these days. This is, this is actually uh, um, MicroPython from 2016 running on an ESP8266. And, and the first thing you get, and let's see if this magic pointer thing, ooh, it does work. Uh, um, the first thing you get is, is, is that you can, ask, you can ask the system for help. How many people in the embedded space would love it if their system actually told them how to use it? <laughs> this, this, ah, ah, back. Uh, um, this is crazy talk. But, but you'll also notice that if you've ever run Python, how, is anybody not familiar with Python? Thank goodness. Okay, I don't have to explain Python to anybody. Uh, um, you can literally just import the machine, and now I have all of the machine-specific information running. Like I'm literally, you can literally just do this on a serial prompt. This is on a terminal, yep. and 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 if you don't understand how powerful serial terminals are, ask any of the hardware people in here what their favorite interface is, and I'm pretty sure they will all tell you the serial interface not only is their favorite but also their most hated, because. Serial should be really, really simple, and everyone gets it wrong, somehow, some way. 
and it drives us all insane. But Serial's great. So you can literally, while the system's running, no, no comp compilation, no nothing, you can import the machine. Well, just for kicks and giggles, import time. We'll start defining random variables on pin two and, and, and setting it for output. And then we just literally just start blinking things. Kind of like that. <laughs> the time it takes with, a modern, uh, uh, with these modern microcontrollers to get to the point where a normal human being, and I mean literally a normal human being, anybody in this room, I've had a, a, um, a lawyer in India sit down with me and in the span of 10 minutes go from not even understanding what the serial console was to blinking an LED in the span of 10 minutes. And I kid you not, by the next day, the, the, this lawyer went home and figured out how to attach a, a board that I had created to Twitter and to blink every time uh, 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 her Twitter account was added at, overnight. This is someone who does not know how to program, or who did not know how to program at all and figured this out overnight on her own. This is huge. This, this is beyond ridiculously fast for trying to do development. And the, and the board, as far as I know, is still running. It still twinkles up every time somebody uh, uh, tweets at her. So, can anybody not figure out what this is doing? Does anybody need me to walk you through this? Because this is astonishingly straightforward for embedded development. Hello world. It's, it's literally hello world. So, if you've, so everybody, you know, the first thing you do when you get a, a, a new language or a new computer or you're trying to play something with, you want to write hello world. And everybody's written hello world. It's the most basic stupid thing in the world. It's print, you know, it's basically echo or printf. Blinking an LED, despite the fact it is sometimes one of the most complicated things you can do on a piece of hardware, is the hello world of hardware. And this takes less than 10 minutes on, on modern uh, devices. And this is fantastic. This is great. It works. Um, but the, the, the nice thing that this leads to is that uh, um, normal software people can actually start exploring more hardware. Because you don't need to worry about how you figure out that that knob right there controls the, the light over here with the power of something. You, know, you don't need to figure this out like that anymore. You're given enough of the, 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 the abstractions. Literally, we're at the point where microcontrollers have enough abstractions because everything in software can be solved with another layer of abstraction. Where normal software people can do embedded uh, uh, hard development. And not only do it hard, uh, 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 embedded hard development, but you can develop ridiculous and crazy things like this. And that's probably actually kind of terrifying for most people. So let's move on. Um, so how many people, uh, uh, I know I've asked this already, how many people have actually designed their own hardware to the board layer? Okay, a couple, couple of you folks. How many people in this room have actually taken an electrical engineering course of any type? Oh, actually, most of you. So most of this is not going to be terribly complicated. This is literally the simplest circuit diagram I could give to you today. It's a battery, ah, and a clicker that really likes to go backwards, a resistor, and an LED. Yeah, literally, that's it. You put a battery in this, and the LED will, will run until it burns itself out or the battery dies. Uh, um, there, there, I can't make this any simpler. Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, I don't even technically need the resistor. I'm technically being very persnickety, persnickety correct having the resistor there at all. So this could actually be simpler. You could just ignore that and, and put a bodge wire in if you need it. But, uh, um, and the reason I point this out is that, you know, you don't need a lot of expertise to really start understanding things. You don't need a lot of expertise to start making things work. Because this is that was literally the schematic for this board that I made for a, 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 an event that we were going to do um, as a soldering kit, where people could come, literally just put a, a, an LED in, hook up a battery, have the resistor so that the LED wasn't too bright. It was really the reason we put the, uh, uh, the resistor in there. And th th this was something that I made literally in a weekend and ordered it uh, um, from a PCB house in China and tried to get it there for the event in time. All of the parts showed up in time. The PCBs were a day late because of a typhoon in Japan. And for a one-day event, being a day late means you missed the entire thing. So it happens. Hardware is hard. And I'm sorry? 
Oh, yeah, no, I have, I have all kinds of leads and the, the, uh, all kinds of things. And in fact, the only thing that really that you can get wrong in even putting this together is putting the LED in backwards. So if your LED didn't work, literally, you should just turn it around because everybody gets the LED uh, um, information on PCB boards wrong. And half the time, if you actually have your manufacturer put the LEDs on the board, they put them on backwards anyway along with half of the other components. But that, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So, unfortunately, uh, um, the screens I keep showing this on are nowhere near uh, um, high resolution enough to, to really show this. This is an open source board that uh, um, uh, uh, I made uh, about three years ago, uh, um, which is called the Battle Bunny. And um, it, th there are lots of things going on up here. And I expect everyone, to, 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 if you've never built a board, to find this ridiculously scary looking. In reality, it's not. Uh, um, because what you've got is you've got things like your microcontroller and you've got some little wires that you, you've explicitly daisy chained off of it. And if you guys ever want to see what this looks like, you can come up and see the, the, the much higher resolution screen here. Or come find me after the talk. Or, or go look for Battle Bunnies on GitHub and you can find the PDF for this. Uh, um, but really what, what all of those little green lines are, are they're, they're indications of wires or signals that you're, you want to send somewhere else on, on the board. And, and you basically literally just, you know, tediously draw out all these lines um, for all the parts and, and, and you put them on there. Uh, or in your schematic editor and you can actually build the, these kinds of things. In fact, you know, there's all these nice little LEDs over here and all these other bits and pieces. But at some point you're going to ask me, how do I know that for the ESP8266 I need this ridiculous looking contraption to actually be able to program it? And this is the really interesting dirty secret of hardware. The manufacturers of the hardware want you to use it. And they go so far as they actually give you the entire circuit diagram to do exactly what you want to do. You actually don't need to, to understand a whole lot of electronics to be able to do this. But let's take a quick, uh, let's take a slightly closer look. As you can see, this is just a, a, a footprint for the 8266. It's got some uh, uh, serial lines, a bunch of GPIOs, and a bunch of other things that are kind of going on here. If you ever use the 8266, do not use pins 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. In all likelihood, they're hooked up to a, uh, um, a firmware chip that you don't actually want to uh, be mucking with. And if you put a GPIO on that, sometimes you uh, fry your flash chip. Ask me how I know this. <laughs> the, the other interesting thing about the ESP8266 is there is not one manufacturer of the ESP8266. And depending on which ESP8266 you get, uh, the, the flash chip that's hidden away underneath this little uh, um, heat, di heat disperser and, and RF shield can be completely different. So the firmware, or the, the, the flash chips can actually change behavior of the entire chip slightly. <clears throat> Don't use those pens, it is really the moral of the story. But, uh, um, so this is great. But it, w when you get to the point where uh, um, you actually want to do something else, Let's take this lithium ion battery charger here. This is the diagram that the company that makes the MCP73831 gives you in the documentation for the chip. So literally all you have to do is tediously copy and paste and draw out the exact same diagram when you want to use it. Can anybody in this room not copy and paste that? Because I, I'm pretty sure all you need to be able to do is click and drag a mouse, and I'm pretty sure anybody in this room can actually uh, 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 replicate this in either KiCad or Eagle or whatever your favorite uh, um, CAD software is. This is not hard. And then once you've gotten to the point where you can do this, this is like a Lego brick. Everything that I ever need that needs a lithium ion 500 milliamp uh, battery charger, guess what I do? I literally go back to the same place that I had that and I copy and paste it. And this is what every hardware person ever does. Is once they've got a, a, a known working circuit diagram, they copy and paste it into every single thing they ever do again until they get to the point where they need to change out whatever chip it is. Um, or there, there's some nuance that they need to change that, you know, maybe there, there's some hidden option to turn this into a, a one amp uh, lithium ion, ion battery charger or something. But this is how hardware is built. The, the, the hardware manufacturers literally want you to make, or want to make this easy so they give you all of the information for you. You don't have to reverse engineer this. How many people knew that before they came into this talk? 
So like the three hardware people who can actually, or the four hardware people who, who could actually correct me. How many people think that this is one of the most amazing things they've ever uh, uh, realized? And how many of you think, uh, 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 realize that literally every uh, hardware company on the world is literally participating in open source and didn't even know it? Is that not cool? So, by the time you, you, you've built up all of these Lego bricks and you really want to go and do something much more cool, you, you, you get your entire, uh, um, you get your, your, your pretty schematic like this. And you're like, great, I figured out how everything should connect. And then you, actually, you, you get to the bit that probably will actually scare you. Because this is what uh, uh, um, your, board, or your initial board will look like. And this is a mess. <laughs> this, th th this is... Uh, um, if you've ever thought of the most complicated, ridiculous piece of co uh, uh, code you've ever tried to, to untangle, or, or literally take every power cord in your house, stick it in your dryer, and put it on spin for like two hours, and then tr uh, pull it out and try and untangle everything, that's literally what you get to do now. Now, and I, and I say that you get to do this because every software person I know go uh, goes and looks at the software and says, there's this thing that says auto route. This will do it for me, right? Now I want everybody in the room to repeat after me. The auto route command should never be used. It always lies. Okay? So when you go to build your own hardware, seriously, never touch the auto route command because auto route notoriously screws everything up because it doesn't actually understand what it's doing. It just tries to find what it believes to be optimal. And optimal does not actually mean that it will work. So, you get to drag all of these things around and then you actually get to, to draw um, little wires all over the place. And, and if you spend a fair amount of time, um, this is really what you're doing. Is you're literally taking wires and you're running them around digitally. My wife even goes so far as to argue that when I'm doing this, I'm digitally knitting. Because as I'm dragging wires around, it looks like I'm, I'm setting up a very complicated knitting pattern. Um, my, my wife being a computer security researcher who knits constantly. Uh, um, so she gets to make fun of me about this kind of stuff. Uh, um, so th th this is literally what you, you, you're doing. And by the time you're all said and done, well, actually, before you get all said and done, you get bored and you build a robot because routing that stuff is always complicated and robots are way more fun. But by the time you actually get done, you've played the Untangle game. Everybody knows the Untangle game, right? You, you know, where you try to, to get all the nodes so that everything doesn't have any wires crossing. Well, this is actually what it looks like when you're done. And this is a fully routed out board, two layer, um, so front and back, uh, um, backboard. Again, the, unfortunately, the projector is probably not actually high resolution enough to, to, for you to really see this. But, but if you want, again, come find me or come find the Battle Bunnies uh, on GitHub and take a look at this. But this is the, f the fully rendered uh, uh, um, version of the Battle Bunny from the schematic that I showed you earlier. And this is great. And from a software perspective, you're like, great, I've done all the hard work, right? The answer is no. Because by the time you've got all these nice digital assets, uh, um, you realize that th they're great, they're awesome, they, um, but I can't actually do anything with it because in the digital world, I can't actually do anything physical. So. The next thing you do is you figure out how to actually call up a, a PCB manufacturer, and there's plenty of good ones out there. I'm not going to name any of them because I don't want anybody to, to, to yell at me for playing favorites with them. Um, but you call them up, you send this off, and, and, and basically you start your compile. And the, it, 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 we're all used to compiling, and we're all, we all love the XKCD comic where it, it, um, everybody goes, it's compiling, right? Yeah. So we're all used to compile times maybe, maybe measured in days like a couple of days. Like if you're building an entire like Yocto distribution or an entire like real operating system from scratch, this can take a couple of days. Or maybe if you're just building LibreOffice or Firefox, you know, it's the same kind of time scale. Um, hardware, when you go to manufacture it, the, the compile time is measured in not hours, not minutes, not days. It's measured in weeks, possibly even months. So, because the first thing that happens is by the time you go and you click the button to say, yes, I would like to pay you many monies, and you will make me things, and you will send it to me, um, 
uh, 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 it goes off to a board manufacturer, and these fascinating machines uh, um, uh, 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 basically end up building this. If you've never seen like a pick and place machine or a PCB manufacturing um, actually be done, go find YouTube videos of it. I mean, seriously, pick and place machines look like an absolute ballet is happening. And the speed at which they're happening is, can be absolutely crazy. So go find it. Uh, um, but while that's all happening, you basically get stuck playing NetHack for, uh, for potentially up to six weeks. And in fact, six weeks is kind of fast when, when you're doing uh, uh, hardware builds and having not only the PCB, PCBs you can usually get back in a few days. Uh, um, actually getting a fully populated board usually takes about six weeks. Um, and that's fairly fast. But you get to play giant net hack in the, in, the, in the time. Now, how many people, when you've compiled Hello World or even a sufficiently complicated uh, program, how many times does it work on the first time? Yeah, zero is a pretty close to uh, the optimal answer. Because this is what happens when you get your first board back. You let the magic smoke out. Because some, you've, done, you've done something wrong somewhere. But you then get the fun of doing it all over again and waiting another six weeks. So this is, why, this is why hardware is always broken, and this is why you should actually, uh, um, this is why as a, a, a software person, I'm actually advocating very strongly that you go and you build your own hardware. Because from a software perspective, we're all used to this. This is exactly what we all want to play with. But we don't actually understand exactly what it's doing underneath. And hardware has gotten to the point where it's easy enough for us as software people to actually design at least simple things so that we know what's actually going on on the system. And microcontrollers, particularly things that can support the ESPs, or, or, or MicroPython, or MicroLua, or any of those kinds of things, um, the, the, these, are, these are things that are approachable to no, uh, enough to us as normal software people, particularly if you work in like the web stack, that you can actually program them. And this is why I'm advocating you to do it, so that you actually understand what, you're, uh, uh, what the hardware is doing. Why? Because flaming octopi with a robot dog sitting underneath them is cool, and because you'll be a, a better programmer and you'll actually understand what you're doing better. So, I know I've kind of rushed through this a little bit. I'm sure everybody has questions, comments, concerns, or just wants to throw fruit at me. So this is your time. I think we've got about 10 minutes, if I had to guess. Yeah, something like that. So, are there any So I'll answer any question you want. Okay. <laughs> Come on, power on that stuff. That's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> really? I was going to say, you know, I'm pretty yeah. sure the Olimex guys would not appreciate me stepping on their stuff. But that's not mine, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can probably guess what most of it does. It, it looks like it's a, a small Linux box that's got a wireless chipset and hooked up to switches and relays. But that's me randomly guessing. Uh, first, very inter entertaining lecture. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, just a small comment. Yeah. If uh, your Hero World program runs smoothly for the first time, then there is something serious. No, there's wrong. something seriously wrong, and you yeah. have done it. Like, like yeah. absolutely delete it, start over, because there's something way worse wrong with it than you could even imagine. Frankly, if, you, if hardware comes back and it works the first time, I'm actually, more, uh, um, I'm actually more scared of that hardware than anything. And I've had, a, had this happen a couple of times on things that were more complicated than literally just an LED circuit. Um, and it's hey, scary. Uh, thanks for the lecture. Uh, yep. Question. What would you recommend to the software guys around here to get started with hardware development. You mentioned TSP-8266, that's... So, so I actually, so personally, I really like the ESP series of, of chips. They're fairly approachable. They're very cheap. Uh, um, even the, uh, so like the ESP-8266 um, is about a dollar or two to put on a board. And you can pick up um, that, that piece of hardware that I showed right at the beginning. That's actually called the Node MCU. Um, that's actually got, a, that's got an ESP8266 on it. If you want to just start with, you know, bread, uh, uh, breadboarding stuff, you can pick those up for less than $5 US, um, particularly if you can get Alibaba um, in here. Uh, um, from a software perspective, um, I'm going to point you towards KiCad for actually doing the design and everything. It's open source. Um, it's fairly approachable, but the learning curve is a little on the steep side. Um, the other options I would normally, or I, I would, 
almost normally try to point people to. They've changed all of their subscription models and they're terrible now, or their, their software licensing models now, and they're all terrible. So KiCad's about the only good option I can point to people to for software. Huh? I'm sorry? Tinkercad is nice, but it's really basic. So it's, uh, I'd, almost want, I'd almost point you towards KiCad just to get you into the, the stuff that you can actually go further with than Tinkercad. Tinkercad's fine, but it's, it, you're gonna run into the ceiling very quickly. So, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to ask about uh, CAT system recommendations, but you oh, okay. can't answer <laughs> that, so yeah. I preempted your question. Well, that is interesting. So we have some more minutes. Any more questions? That's your chance, guys. I was going to say, it's either that or I, st oh. I start telling weird stories about Harbor. Where are you from? I'm from Portland, Oregon. Portland. 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 Yep. Oh, Rainy Portland, Oregon. Okay, actually, we have some more questions. So yep. Thank you. It was <laughs> yeah. uh, a very interesting uh, lecture. I'm just uh, curious uh, what on earth did you need a 48 layer board for? <laughs> Okay, so the, the, the board in question actually came from a company called C2 Microsystems, and what, this, is, this is back in the dark ages before we had multiple cores on a CPU. And so what we were doing was actually putting 12 full uh, um, uh, uh, Transmeta uh, uh, computers on a single PCB with two full gigabit Ethernet networks across the entire network so that you could actually do hyper, or high performance computing in a single 15 amp uh, wall outlet. So th th this is l like literally your laptop today, uh, probably even your phone today is more powerful than the system I'm talking about um, and uses dramatically less power. But th th it's the, the, the scale of putting this much stuff on a single PCB, it, you should never do that. <laughs> it, it was basically an end, it was an end run around the fact that CPUs didn't have multiple cores yet. So, yeah. Shout it, I'll just repeat it. Uh, well, one more question. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you, you show some Python code. Uh, is this micro Python or circuit Python you're running? Uh, so, so all of the code, like, like this, this is specifically uh, uh, micro Python. The code for circuit Python is going to be very close. The, the, the major differences between circuit Python and micro Python are going to be that Adafruit has gone out of their way to make the, uh, um, the hardware abstraction layer as consistent across boards as possible, and they have very specific requirements on what hardware they support as a result. So. Yeah, oh, that goes to my next question, out yep. of fruit, and they're trying to make something which is easily, very easy to step yep. into the hardware world. What's, what's your opinion on, on that, on those products? I was gonna say, from out of fruit's perspective, they're doing exactly what they need to do, uh, um, because they, they're not necessarily targeting people who are making their own hardware. They're trying to get people through trying to actually interface with the hardware that Adafruit's trying to sell. And they're making, uh, you know, their, their driver stacks very specifically uh, um, set up and, and good for that. Um, and frankly, everything I've seen out of them has been top notch. My only small grumble is that uh, um, CircuitPython stuff is not actually compatible with MicroPython stuff because CircuitPython assumes a bunch of other stuff and it makes me slightly sad but I can't actually blame anybody for, for me being sad. So, and I, yeah, and I know he had a question. <laughs> Hi, uh, do, you, uh, do you think uh, that uh, trying to do embedded development on x86 is a complete total suicide? It's a, a very, very bad idea, or there is a <laughs> tiny, tiny, small chance in some point Intel to ever be able to do something? So it, it's interesting you ask me this question, because I actually did a board um, for a, a fairly well-known conference uh, uh, that, that happens in, uh, uh, in Las Vegas um, that actually used an x86 microcontroller called the D2000 uh, uh, that Intel did. Um, not a super popular chip, um, not a very cheap chip if anyone at Intel is paying attention. Uh, um, can we have more of those kinds of chips, possibly with uh, uh, networking stacks and, and have them be as cheap as the ESP8266? Um, that'd be nice, probably never happened, but you know, it'd be nice. Um, but the, 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 there are embedded stacks uh, 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 for x86 chips. Now, if you're talking about like a Xeon or a, a Core i9 or something like that, I, these are the wrong chips for trying to do proper embedded, uh, embedded designs. But uh, there the, are, are a few rare uh, um, and, and sometimes uh, uh, difficult to find uh, uh, chips like the D2000 that are x86 based 
uh, um, at least somewhere under the covers are sex 86. Uh, um, and, and frankly, the, uh, um, I actually liked working on the chip for the most part, even from a, a, a design perspective, it was a, a fairly nice chip. It's a little more complicated than something like the ESP8266 to get working. Um, and at the time, the software support was a little, uh, it's gotten better for the D2000 specifically. Uh, um, so it'd be much more pleasant nowadays, like things like Zephyr support it dramatically better than, than when I first looked at it. So um, yes, x86 is a potentially viable embedded platform. The problem is just finding chips. And I, I, I don't remember what we got the chips for, but it was dramatically more than a dollar. So a sad story. Yeah, it, uh, yeah. We all wish to X86. Oh no, I, I was gonna say that the, the interesting thing is, is from a, a hardware perspective, everybody's like, you know, oh well, you know, it only costs 10 cents more. Well, if you're building a million of these things, that's that, that 10 cents or even a penny uh, um, adds up very, very quickly. So, you know, a chip that, you know, if my option is, is I have a chip that's, you know, a dollar that's, you know, uh, that, that runs 10 times faster than a chip that's four dollars and this chip is dramatically better. Well, everyone and the, their dog's gonna use the dollar chip, so. Especially if you develop for a, a, a mass scale. Yeah. Obviously, even half a dollar may be important. Yeah. I, it, it, I just want to say, I'm not related to that company. <laughs> I'm really, I'm yeah. Italian, and uh, I'm just a customer. But I want to say to Bulgarian people that you have that company, I will, I will not say. They're uh, very nice. Which is <laughs> Bulgarian, and they uh, have a lot of uh, interesting products based on HE, ESP8266 yeah. and also ESP32 yeah. boards and proto boards and really yeah, interesting. I, I was going to say, I'll, I, I mean, since they're sitting here, it's going to be hard for them to do They are also me. open I, hardware. So. Yeah, I was going to say, Olamex is actually really awesome uh, um, for being an open uh, hardware uh, participant. And I mean, honestly, my hat goes off to them for being um, as good at, uh, at it as they are. Because um, there's a lot of companies who claim to be open hardware, but they don't really quite deliver on it. And Olimax is actually, I mean, at least in everything I've ever dealt with with them has been really awesome. So I will, I, I, I will name them and I will, I will happily give them some praise. So. There are still a couple of minutes for questions. So oh, wow. Do you That's have uh, <laughs> any more questions? <laughs> Okay, it seems not so. Let us applaud him again yep. for his uh, Thank you very presentation. Much.